So, good afternoon, everybody. Dirk, are we online? <laughs> okay. And welcome to the LISA end of mission event. Uh, so, I went for lunch today uh, with people who know more about the mission than myself, uh, with uh, Ian Harrison, the spacecraft operations manager, with uh, our good friend and partner from the science directorate, Martin Kessler, glad to have you here. Our prime number one customer in ESOC, and uh, with Juan Miro. Uh, now, uh, about Lisa, we will hear a lot. Uh, what do we do at ESOC? Since uh, 15 years, uh, we are operating space missions, uh, some of them more challenging, others less challenging. And uh, with Lisa, uh, every mission is special. Uh, Lisa was special in a way uh, that it's uh, a mission to Lagrange point number one uh, at a distance of 1.5 million kilometers uh, and uh, to bring a spacecraft from a launch on a Vega rocket, the smallest of the European uh, uh, launcher family, uh, inserted in a 200 by 1,500 kilometer orbit to bring it from there, from 200 kilometers in extreme case, out to 1.5 uh, million kilometers. Uh, there's no gas station along the way. And uh, this is a challenge in itself. And this is uh, why I always say uh, ESOG is more than the mission operations, uh, the, uh, more than the, than the control room that everybody knows. Uh, before a mission goes to the launch pad, uh, our flight dynamics people have uh, designed a trajectory uh, to get the spacecraft uh, where we want it to have. And uh, once again, we have all reasons, uh, I at least uh, have all reason to be proud on the ESOC team. And uh, I'm sure the scientists uh, are nodding. So <laughs> I, uh, I trust that good science came out of this as well. So uh, we're having the honor at ESOC today uh, to celebrate end of mission of LISA. When you do an end of mission, uh, either something was wrong, it's the end of mission immediately. Uh, when, uh, when you run out of budget, as a valid reason, and when you uh, have accomplished the mission, uh, the mission has done what it's supposed to do, and uh, so two of these criteria, I guess, are true for LISA Pathfinder. Uh, from, uh, from what I understood, uh, LISA has overperformed, uh, and uh, so uh, it deserves a rest. And uh, we can focus then uh, to go for the full Monty in uh, somewhere in the 2030s is what I understand. Uh, so the PIs tell me uh, ready to go. And in a humble way, they say, uh, well, not over, not overstressed or overperformance. But uh, from uh, what other people told me, uh, you can be quite pleased uh, with what came out of it. Uh, so uh, I guess somebody. PIs this evening by eight will push the button and deactivate the spacecraft. And then uh, the spacecraft will orbit around the sun, uh, 200 uh, within Earth's orbit, uh, two million kilometers away from Earth, so in a safe distance. And uh, it will have sunshine uh, forever in the future. Uh, so at least uh, for many, many, many years. So uh, from a technical point of view, I understand uh, this was proof of concept. Uh, PIs feel comfortable uh, that we can go for the full Monty in 2034. Uh, I myself used to work in astronomy uh, back when I was still working, uh, but uh, uh, still about gravitational waves, uh, I do not understand too much. All I know is what I learned over lunch, thanks to, uh, thanks to Ian and, uh, and Martin. So I understand uh, ripples in space uh, is what gravitational waves are, most likely caused by a collision of uh, enormous masses like uh, massive black holes uh, going uh, through matter, antimatter galaxies, and so on. Uh, seems at least uh, makes sense to me. Uh, I said ESOC celebrates its uh, 50th anniversary this year, and over these 50 years, uh, uh, I think we have seen uh, evolution of, not, if not a revolution of astronomy. Uh, so during this time, uh, we have seen uh, the Hubble mission 
revolutionizing our understanding of the universe. Uh, we have seen, uh, uh, we have been on a comet uh, with our Zeta mission. Uh, we are still operating the Gaia mission, the Billion Star mission, which will be the will create the reference catalog for generations of uh, astronomical missions to come. So uh, I think uh, this is the time to congratulate uh, the scientists, uh, to, uh, to praise uh, team effort, uh, two PIs, Carsten Danzmann and Stefano. Uh, little <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so thanks a lot for creating the idea. Uh, the, uh, all the teams uh, to thank uh, our good customers from the Science Directorate. Science Directorate today uh, being represented by Martin Kessler uh, to express pride on our own people. And uh, as I say, uh, let's not fall in a collective depression. Uh, let's celebrate success. Thank you very much. Bit of luck and windows. Shall I press the button already? No, it's pressed. Okay, so thanks to Rolf for his introductory speech, and I would like to welcome you all. It's uh, a little bit of a sad day because we're terminating a very nice mission. But as it was said before, we have a very good reason for terminating it, which is we have achieved actually more than we hoped for. And I think we will hear about this later. We have pulled together a little program uh, which will lead you into all the uh, depths of gravity waves and what it is all about, what we have achieved with the mission uh, with our gravitational reference sensor, also the LISA, called the LISA test package. We have also a short presentation about the DRS system, the disturbance reduction system, which was contributed by NASA from Phil Barella. And at the end, I uh, think, uh, the outlook into the future by Carsten. So uh, you won't get bored, except maybe for the first 15 minutes, where I'm afraid I will speak. And Ian, we will talk to you a little bit about the uh, operational life of this mission. Okay. It should work. Okay. So it's going to be an overview from Lee up until today. So effectively, a mission overview for those of you who don't know, um, what Rolf said actually is, is pictured here in this diagram, giving quick mission overview. We started with this mission on a very low Earth orbit and then ended up in an orbit, operational orbit uh, around Lagrange 1. And I can tell you on the, on the 2nd of December, I think, which was the first launch attempt, didn't quite make it. There was a problem with Vega. We had to reschedule the day after. We were already inquiring about the possibilities of what would happen if the A1 wouldn't fire all the way through and, and uh, whether we could recover the mission. But all of these scenarios didn't come true in the end. So it's a good, nice end of the story. But if we say we at ESOC, you know, we're normally when we present, we say we do LEOs, we do uh, highly eccentric orbits, we do Lagrange missions, though except for interplanetary, which you get now in a way with Lisa Pathfinder. At the end of the mission, we've done it all with one mission which is laser pathfinder. We, we started up in a low Earth orbit, 200 times 1,500 kilometers, and all of this in X-band, which normally these missions at these low Earth orbits don't use. So this is just to recall the LISA technology package. Uh, you will see it in here. This is two beautiful little cubes, very finely manufactured, in order to avoid any disturbances in the laser uh, system, metrology system in between to measure the distance very precisely. And, and this is the core uh, of the mission, so to speak. That, by the way, is the science module on top of the uh, propulsion module, which we used to get us to L1. And uh, a short summary of the LEOB itself. We were launched, obviously, on the 3rd of December from Kourou. Uh, we had the countdown, launch and separation, the biprop system priming on the first day of the LEOB, the attitude acquisition all went very well. Star Trek switch on, system checkout, it was all fine. 
And then, actually, we had left ourselves the margin of two to three days in order to see, in case things were going wrong, we had a buffer. And actually, not much was going wrong, but we needed the buffer because we had some issues with the star tracker, you know, not exactly pointing, and we'll come to that in a minute, uh, not exactly providing the outputs all the time that we expected, and there were some other challenges, and all of it took us a bit of time, and I think these two days really made a difference. Thereafter, of course, the orbit raising with six apogee raising burns in order to get our and a touch-up burn, in order to get ourselves and a transfer to L1, and we can say after these 10 days, we'd actually achieved what normally you get out of a a rocket which is properly sized for a mission. Effectively, you were on an escape orbit to L1, uh, or an orbit to L1, getting away from the Earth. And uh, so it was three kilometers per second and around 1,260 kilograms of propellant and pressure. Okay, after this transfer to L1 commissioning activity started, at the end, the separation of SCM and PRM, uh, before we started actually working with the science module, and Ian will come to that. So here you see what I mentioned before was the pictures of the star tracker, and it's, yes, you can see a little bit of sky in the background, which is over here, and here you can see stars, but all of this is, of course, Mother Earth. And here, actually, is a picture where the star tracker is looking with the foresight onto Earth, and you can see that, so it's quite rather unusual pictures. It's not an Earth observation mission. This was the orbit raising sequence, the plan, and you can see all the delta Vs we did, and, and all of them very carefully planned and timed by our flight dynamics colleagues, and it worked pretty much to plan, except the later burns, of course, got a bit delayed because the orbits uh, were slightly different from what we assumed, and there you get a little timing delay, but otherwise it was all fine. And this, of course, before I hand over to Ian, is an important souvenir for all of us who have participated in the mission. This was taken before launch on the 30th of November, uh, it was the pre-launch picture of the mission control team. So credits for having achieved this first phase of the mission, very important, but in the end, you know, when you see the signs, of course, that's even more important, but it was important to get us there in the first place. So thank you very much to all these team members who contributed. Thank you. Okay, I'll try and take over from what uh, Andreas finished and continue the brief summary of Lisa Pathfinder from then until we are now. So it's going to be a very condensed version, but it will just give you a bit of background so that when the scientists give the interesting stuff about all the sciencey stuff, you've got a bit of background to how to plug it in for Lisa Pathfinder. So after the LEOP finished on about the 14th, oh, 13th of December, the next day, 14th of December, we started the commissioning activities. From the 14th of December to Christmas, we basically commissioned the service module um, with the support of Industrial Prime from Airbus and Stevenage. And then on the 22nd of January, just after Christmas, we did the propulsion, when we were uh, finished with the propulsion module, when we were basically in an orbit that would make, give us a free drift into L1, which could be corrected with the micropropulsion system. We did the separation of the propulsion system from the science module, and after that, we could then release the test masses. So this happened on the 22nd uh, of January. And as you see here, you can see the, the spin-up, which happened in about, I don't know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And then the spin-down with the micropropulsion system, which took about nine or 10 hours. In fact, the winner of the sweepstake, where's Dave? Ooh. How how long was it exactly, Dave? I don't know, it's about 19 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we had a small sweepstake here on the duration it would take for the D-spin, and uh, Dave over there won the sweepstake. Um, it took a lot longer than we thought. At the start, you see it decelerating very quickly, but this denutation phase took a lot, lot longer than we thought, and since the, it took us a lot longer to despin the whole spacecraft. Um, immediately after Christmas, we started uh, the DRS commissioning. So I think this was the 2nd of January. I don't think we did anything on the 1st. We took Christmas and the 1st of January off, and then the 2nd of January, our JPL colleagues were over here in the PISA room, and we started the DRS commissioning activities. Um, Following that, the first couple of weeks of DRS commissioning, shortly later we then re released the test masses, and these were on the 15th and 16th, I say of January, it's actually the 15th and 16th of February, so I need to correct that. So here you can see quite clearly, this is the, the first one, where's the pointer? This is the, the test mass two, which is actually quite problematic. After we released the test mass, it got stuck in the corner and quite required a few small nudges from a plunger. So this is a me mechanical finger that normally contains the test mass. 
needed a small nudge of the test mass to release it again before it could uh, get connect, uh, contact or uh, controlled by the electrostatics. And this here is the test mass one, which behaved itself very well, a lot better. But still, you can see one, two, one, two, three, four impacts where it bounced off the plunger or the wall before we had damped the velocity down sufficiently for the electrostatics to capture it. But still, after those two days, we'd got both test masses electrostatically controlled, uh, so sensing and actuation uh, by the electrostatics within the test mass enclosure. Um, after we'd done the commissioning activities, which uh, completed on about 29th of February, everything went to plan. We had problems during the commissioning, but they all were resolved within the time scale of the commissioning activity itself. And so even though the test mass release on the 15th and 16th were exactly the times were meant to be released, and we had the in-orbit commissioning review uh, in the first week of March that year. But uh, before that, the project manager had already given us the unofficial uh, go-ahead to start with the routine operations phase. And basically, straight away out of the box, uh, the LISA test, pack, LISA test package and the LISA Pathfinder itself worked uh, better than anyone could expect, uh, basically matching the specifications of the LISA mission itself, straight away out, the, out of the box. And then the scientists and the science working team and the science operations team started improving this performance or measuring the performance and improving it over the next four months. Uh, after four months of operations of the ESA LISA test package uh, under ESA control, we handed over the operations to the DRS phase. So we had two weeks of commissioning activities with the JPL team here on site from about the 26th of June to the 8th of July. And this is when we did uh, the second phase of the NASA DRS commissioning where we had closed loop control. The first phase was a check out of the hardware and this phase is where we actually handed over control of the whole LISA Pathfinder spacecraft for the DRS control. This all went very well. Um, shortly after we started the routine phase of the DRS, we had a small issue with the DRS cluster two. One of the circuits phase failed and required a small update to the DRS flight software. So we temporarily handed back for LTP operations for a week or two while the DRS uh, fixed this in the flight software. And then we will continue the DRS operations phase for another few months. And then we had another small problem with the DRS thruster four towards the end of their phase. And then again, we worked this around and we ended up continuing with the DRS operations until early December. Um, in this phase, we're using four of the cold gas thrusters in fixed thrust mode to provide a small force torque crutch for the DRS to act against so they could uh, conduct their science operations, DRS science mode. Uh, after this, uh, we actually started uh, requesting for the extension of LISA Pathfinder almost immediately after launch. So I think we're having discussions pretty much just at the end of the commissioning phase for the extending the mission, because the mission would normally end on the end of October. So straight away, by the summer of 2016, we had an agreement to extend by six months uh, the El Lisa Pathfinder operations, and this was until the 30th of May, 2017. And then we managed to stretch uh, the budget envelope a little bit, so we actually ran science operations to the end of uh, 30th of June, 2017. Also in this phase, we uh, ran a small experiment on the side on one of the star trackers, on the redundant star tracker, a small near experiment to try and use the redundant star trackers on board a spacecraft to detect uh, near-Earth objects, in particular asteroids. Um, I've got a couple of little movies here, hopefully, and uh, maybe they won't work. A couple of little movies there for some of the results that came out of it. And this is in the first weekend of operations of the, the Star Tracker in the NEO mode. Hopefully it will start up. And this is the type of thing they were looking for. Um, a blank screen. There's not a lot you can see, but right in the middle of the screen, if you look closely, you can see what looks like a little, uh, an object passing through the middle. And this is all they're looking for for their um, Star Tracker operations. Each one of those frames is one hour of uh, integrated uh, time over the star tracker. They then merge them together, and they're looking for objects moving through their field of view. And this was in the first weekend. They found a couple of objects, and since then, I believe they found a lot more. Still waiting for a presentation for all the science data from them. But uh, my understanding is they've found quite a few other asteroids, including known asteroid events. So I think for them, <coughs> it was a big success, and we ran it for about six or seven weeks on Lisa Pathfinder. Um, during the middle of this extension phase, uh, on, the 6th, uh, on the 9th of April, we actually conducted a, a one meter per second delta V burn 
to basically dispose of the LISA Pathfinder spacecraft. So this then uh, pushed the LISA Pathfinder the other side of L1 into a heliocentric orbit. And from then, we've not been able to recover the mission. At that point, LISA Pathfinder was always going to leave the L1 orbit and would go into a heliocentric orbit just inside that of the Earth. Um, we had a few small issues with uh, short-term replanning due to underperformance of cold gas, but all these were worked out. And the scientists quite liked from then onwards because we didn't need to do any uh, station-keeping burns. We were leaving L1. We'd stay in within the L1 zone for at least another three or four months to complete science operations, but no more science operations were needed. Oh, let's go to fall again. And this is a, a small chart from mission, mission analysis colleagues. Um, they've done, crunched uh, the final orbit the LISA Pathfinder is in. Uh, and their estimates with the, the, using the latest orbit that we have from LISA Pathfinder, uh, they say that the chance of return to the sort of Earth-Moon system, which means under their assumptions within one million kilometers of the Earth, are less than 0.2% over the next 100 years. This is what we're aiming to achieve. We're hoping to achieve sort of less than 1%, and uh, currently we're at roughly less than 0.2%. We'll rerun these figures again when we get the final orbit next week or so, or sometime later this year. But at the moment, they're very happy with this disposal around, uh, around the sun. Um, the final last two weeks have also been quite intense. Uh, we stopped the, the science operation phase on the 30th of June. And for the last two weeks, we've been running various hardware uh, investigations coming in from various hardware providers, industrial prime, et cetera. So we've run a number of experiments on many of the subsystems on board, on board both for the service module, the power thermal, the coal gas, and also on some of the payload aspects, the ISFE, the phase meter. Uh, we ran continuous discharge and a few other things which we hadn't managed to do during the normal mission phase. So we managed to try and pack in a lot of hardware runs in the last two weeks, um, usually the ones that are slightly oh, a lot higher risk that we couldn't possibly do while we still had the science operations running. Some of these will feed straight forward into future missions like Euclid. We had uh, the Euclid team here we're observing some of the coal gas checkout, and some would hopefully help the, the LISA mission, particularly those for the ISFE, um, new activation algorithms, etc. Yesterday, uh, we completed, uh, we switched off the LISA test package around 1500 Zulu, and we grabbed the test masses around 1430 Zulu. Um, we've passivated the A side with uh, the corruption of the E squared prom decompression algorithm on board on both E squared prom images on the A side. And we completed the final dumps of the science data. We ran a small uh, science mode over the weekend. We ramped up to science mode again and ran uh, a smaller uh, signal on the test mass one and two because there was a, a small solo activity event over the weekend. So hopefully that data will be down on the ground now. We had dumped through till 16 Zulu yesterday or the end of the pass yesterday. So this thing can be looked at offline. So everything is completed on the spacecraft side. So today we're going to do the final side. We'll switch to the B side of the data handling, which we've never used before. So hopefully the processor module B powers up. If not, we'll have switched it off early. Um, <laughs> but hopefully it will power up at the start of this pass. And uh, we'll then again corrupt the, the B side E squared prom with the decompression software. And then the final commanding will be sent by Stefano, which will be the final switch off which is the activation of the corrupted software image and the switch off for the transmitters by both Relay and uh, LCL. So we have a double barrier against the transmitter coming on again. Anyway, that gives me a quick, gives everyone a quick overview of Lisa Pathfinder, where we've been, launched until now. And now I think what most of you will come for, which is the really interesting stuff about the future and all the sciencey stuff that's been processed. So I'll pass over now to Paul, who will give you a, a summary or an intro into Lisa Pathfinder science. Now I'll run off. Cool. Hey, it's not much use, unfortunately. I'm afraid I'm going to take this off. It's easier to walk around with it. So thank you very much for being here. It's a, a kind of bittersweet day today because we're coming to the end of this one. You see we're all wear, wearing black. It's a bit unfortunate that we all have black T-shirts, but we're here to celebrate Pathfinder, not to mourn the end of the mission. So we've got a couple of talks. Uh, I'm going to give a kind of a general overview of Lisa Pathfinder and then hand over to Stefano and he'll go through the details of the, the LTP part and then Phil will talk about whatever Phil is somewhere 
over there. We'll talk about the, the DRS and then just about Lisa. So let's kick off. So what is Pathfinder? Well, as we say, it's the first steps to observing gravitational waves from space. Uh, we'll come back to gravitational waves in a minute. As we heard, it was launched on the 3rd of December 2015 on a Vega. Our science operations ran from the 1st of March through to the 30th of June of this year, 1st of March 16. And the takeaway message from everything today is the performance of this spacecraft and instrument has surpassed even our wildest dreams. You know, if you'd asked us on the 2nd of December, let's say 2015, what would we have achieved? We would never have guessed we'd have been as good as we are. It's just been an absolutely wonderful mission. So Pathfinder essentially is not a, it's not a gravitational wave detector. So we take the millions of kilometer arms you would have for something like LISA, we shrink it down to 40 centimeters, put it inside, inside the spacecraft, uh, and that becomes LISA Pathfinder. So we can't measure gravitational waves, but what we do is we maintain all the instrument noise, everything which could perturb the gravitational wave measurement, that's all local to the spacecraft. So we maintain that, and we actually make it worse, because we've got the two test masses sharing the same arm in a spacecraft. So Pathfinder is actually harder to do than LISA. But gravitational waves, so what are gravitational waves? Actually, let me just plug this thing in and I can walk around a bit. So if you go way back to, to Newton, then we had this instantaneous action at a distance. So something happened in the universe and you knew about it, so time was not relative. And it doesn't work. Okay. It does work. But then Einstein came along, and as we know, Einstein said that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if you're sitting here on Earth and something happens somewhere in the universe, there has to be something carrying that information, that gravitational information to you, and that's what we call gravitational waves. So gravitational waves, they're ripples in the curvature of space-time, as we heard earlier. They're produced by the motion of mass and energy. This is any mass, any energy, waving your hands. That will create gravitational waves, any acceleration of mass and energy. And you see this, I was going to use that, that doesn't work. But you can see the, the, sort of the waves emanating from the binary stars on the top right-hand corner. And they're creating these waves. And that's what we're trying to measure. We're trying to pick up the, the motion of the universe itself, which is uh, vibrating. Now, mass and energy, uh, if you look down at the bottom right, you can see this is our sort of understanding of the universe after Planck, where we have about 4% of the universe is the stuff we know about, the baryonic matter. About 0.4% of that is the stuff that shines. So we know about 0.4% of the universe is what we can see. About roughly a quarter of the universe, 23%, is dark matter. And about three quarters of the universe is dark energy. So most of the universe is dark. And for people who don't know astronomers, when you don't understand it, you call it dark or black. So in this case, we're dark energy, dark matter. But we might actually be able to start, well, we know that dark matter interacts through gravity. And with gravitational waves, maybe we can start to probe the dark side of the universe. We can start to see, feel uh, dark matter. So that's one of the reasons why we're really interested in doing gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves travel through the universe almost unimpeded. They do get some slight uh, lensing. But that's great because it means that you can look to the far reaches of the universe. You can look right back to the Big Bang in principle with gravitational waves. So it's very nice as a, a tool to observe the distant universe. It's very bad in the sense that they're very hard to detect because they don't interact. And so that's why in the universe, this, you know, space is very stiff. It doesn't like to warp. But we have to build something which can measure this entity, space-time, which doesn't like to move. Uh, and that's the, the difficulty with gravitational waves. And these things are quadrupole in nature, so there's not like a dipole. If you put a little cork in the water, it bobs up and down. Here you've got to imagine that the wave is traveling along this kind of caterpillar-like thing. And if you look at it edge on, you can see it's stretching and squeezing, stretching and squeezing. So as a, the wave is coming towards me, I get slightly taller, slightly thinner, which is good. Next half cycle, I get slightly shorter, slightly fatter. That's not so good. But you can see how you measure uh, gravitational waves. What you really want to do is you want to measure this axis with respect to that axis. Or as Stefan will show, you can also do it with triangles. You can measure this line with respect to that line, and that will give you a good measurement of a gravitational wave. And that's why Lisa happens to be a triangle. So gravitational waves carry entirely new information about the universe. Let's put sound up here. So, so what? There's a nice little illustration to show you why do we want to measure gravitational waves. See so here we have, looks like we're in a jungle somewhere. Nice waterfalls. Uh, you know, there's more of a jungle. There's some trees, there's some clouds. But so what? Now you turn on an extra dimension, and suddenly your jungle comes alive. You hear there's monkeys in there. There's birds. There's various things. You hear the waterfall before you even see it. It's through the part of the universe, the part of the jungle is so big. And suddenly this is no longer just a couple of trees and some clouds. It's a whole living ecosystem. 
And that's what gravitational waves is giving you. It's giving you that whole new dimension to the universe, the part we'll never be able to see. So, again, if we'd done this presentation two years ago before launch, this chart wouldn't be here, because this was the first ever measurement of a gravitational wave. We call it GW 150914. So 2015, September the 14th, the first ever gravitational wave was observed by the LIGO detectors in the US. Now these detectors are big L-shaped interferometers. Uh, from the center to the end is about four kilometers, actually it is four kilometers. And when the gravitational wave passes, these arms change by a tiny fraction of a meter. Here we're talking about 10 to minus 18 meters, something on that level. So almost nothing, something around about the classical size of an electron. And this is a signal, you can see, well, I can't point with that. Uh, here you can see as uh, the gravitational wave came, the signal got up, 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 big signal, and then dies away. And that is, I'll show you in a second what that is, that's the two sources uh, orbiting each other. And if you put that and play it through a loudspeaker, it sounds like this. It's transposed up so it's a bit easier to hear. And back to the original data. And again, transposed. And that was the first ever measurement of a gravitational wave. And what you're really seeing there, and uh, clear to see, but you're seeing there's two black holes. These two black holes are about 36 solar masses for the big one, 29 solar masses for the small one. They're located about 1.3 billion light years from Earth. And they've been orbiting each other for a very long time. And as they get closer together, if you look at the top right, you'll start to see the simulation of the waves passing. And as the black holes get closer together, they get a bit faster, the waves pick up. You see the air starts to wobble, and eventually they form one object, and that's the signal. So that's what we saw in the last chart, where this signal starts to get faster and faster and bigger and bigger as the two black holes are merging. And this put out a phenomenal amount of energy. This is one object, this one source of gravitational waves emitted more energy than the entire universe put together, entire electromagnetic universe, one single source. And this is roughly a stellar mass black hole, something in the order of tens of solar masses. There are many other, well, I shall come back to that in a second, but there are many other types of black holes, supermassive black holes, and that's what we're looking for in LISA. But the question is, so we're gravitational wave scientists, so to us, gravitational wave, the first detection of gravitational waves is very, very important. It's the, the breakthrough of the decade, if not the century. But really, is it an important discovery? Well, FizRev Letters is one of the top journals in physics. Uh, the paper was published in it. If you're a scientist, get your paper published. That's good. We actually even got onto the front cover of FizRev Letters. That's very good. That shows that you know, it really was the best paper of that, that month. If you look at the date, you may not see it there, but that's 12th of February, 2016, the paper was published. Not only LIGO got on the front cover of FizRev Letters, but so did Pathfinder. A few months later, we also made a front cover. So again, we were delighted. Big review, big paper, we were on front cover. It's important. But only scientists read these journals, no one else. So was it important? Yes, made a front cover of New York Times, and Carson can probably tell a number, but 200 and something front pages. 671 front pages around the world carried the story of gravitational waves. But newspapers are old hat. No one reads newspapers, do social media. Well, along came Barack Obama. Einstein was right. Congrats, uh, congrats to NSF and LIGO on detecting gravitational waves, a huge breakthrough in how we understand the universe. Great. However, some people think fake news can't be right. <laughs> so, how do you know you've made a massive discovery? Well, if anyone watches the Big Bang Theory, you know Sheldon? Well, again, you can't see it, but he's wearing the gravitational wave. That means then you know you've really made it. And he's actually quite a big fan of us because that's actually a picture, I think that's actually a Lisa picture, where he's showing the, the two black holes merging. So, yes, it is a big discovery. <coughs> but this is the spectrum. So LIGO was looking for things roughly the size of the sun, so one to 100 times the, the mass of the sun, black holes. But you can look at objects throughout the universe, not only the small objects, but the supermassive objects. Uh, and if you look at this, the whole spectrum of gravitational waves. So if you go to a bit lower frequency, which means more massive objects, you have a space-based interferometers, you know why we're here today, you talk about LISA. Uh, and there we're looking at things like supermassive black holes, galaxies merging. Uh, we're looking at small black holes falling into big black holes. We're also seeing lots of objects in our own galaxy, compact binaries, so white dwarf, white dwarf interacting binaries. All these things are emitting gravitational waves which we can measure. So one difference between LIGO and LISA is LISA is signal dominated. When it goes up there, it's gonna be flooded by uh, data. Whereas in LIGO, we're still waiting for signals to come. So it's more, it's, it's getting trans, not trans, but burst-like sources. 
We can then look at very low frequencies. We can use pulsars. So use the universe itself as a gravitational wave detector. We measure the timing of pulsars around the, surrounding the Earth. And you can look for variations, modulations in the pulse arrival times. And you can use that to measure gravitational waves. Or you can look all the way back to the Big Bang, and you can use things like Planck uh, to look at the polarization of the cosmic microwave background, and again, infer the gravitational waves which have been imprinted onto the CMB. But we're here to talk about LISA. So this is LISA. It's uh, two and a half million kilometers between the satellites. This is not to scale. Uh, and they tumble. They just fall around the Earth. So if you look inside, or you look at LISA itself, what is it? So we have three spacecraft separated by millions of kilometers. And the only link between the spacecraft is laser light. And it's not a lot of laser light. We're shining about two watts of light out of the, oops, there's some writing up there. There's two watts uh, coming out of the spacecraft, and we detect a few hundred picowatts, so almost nothing at the far end. But that's enough for us to make this measurement. And when a gravitational wave passes by, LISA is sensitive to any changes in the length of the millions of kilometer arms to about the tenth the size of an atom. So phenomenal, tiny, tiny amount over millions of kilometers. And if you want to scale that up to say, what does that mean? Because you know, it's kind of hard to tell these numbers. If you were to scale LISA to be the distance between the sun and the next star, it would change that distance by about a millimeter. So you think about a mill millimeter is something you can comprehend. The next distance, the next star, you can't, but you just know it's far away. That's the sort of precision we have with an instrument like LISA or LIGO. Now, very often, people ask, especially around about now, say, you know, now you have LISA Pathfinder, what are you going to do next? How do you get to LISA? And we always say, no, that's not right, because LISA came first, and then LISA Pathfinder came after it. So this is LISA, a uh, very quick description. It's three spacecraft, separated millions of kilometers. And scientifically, the role of each spacecraft is to protect a fiducial mass inside. In our case, a fiducial mass is a gold platinum cube, uh, two kilograms of gold platinum, four to six millimeters on the side. And the spacecraft basically flies around the cube. So I have to take my mic away here, but if this is the, the cube, the spacecraft around it, as the cube moves, the spacecraft follows. So scientifically, that's its role. Of course, it also does avionics, power, all the rest of it, but not as a, as from a science side. If we look inside one of these guys, what we have is a, a telescope to get the light between the spacecraft, an optical bench, and this little orange cylinder, which houses the gold platinum cube. And what we can do is we can measure the position of the little cube. We can measure capacitive sensing for six degrees of freedom, so we know exactly where it's moving, position and attitude. And we also have a high-resolution laser interferometer measuring the distance, longitudinal distance, and the attitude around the laser beam. We then take those signals, we feed it back into the control system, which we call DFAX, drag-free and attitude control system, and we feed that back to the spacecraft, and we make the spacecraft follow. And that's a rough idea. We then build up the arm of LISA. We don't do it directly. We measure, here it says PM, which is proof mass or test mass, to the optical bench, which is a spacecraft. We then measure spacecraft to the other spacecraft millions of kilometers away, and then we measure spacecraft to optical bench. And by summing the three measurements, you get the distance between the two cubes. You do the same in the other arm, you do a bit of magic, and you end up coming out with your gravitational wave signal. So what is LISA Pathfinder? How does it relate to this? Well, we have two test masses in our little, now they're no longer orange, but they're see-through, but in the vacuum enclosures. We have a laser interferometer measuring position of a test mass with respect to the spacecraft, the same as the LISA local measurement, and also test mass to test mass, which is not the same as a LISA test mass to test mass. We have the capacitive readout in all axes, exactly the same as LISA. We have the drag-free attitude control system, almost identical to LISA. And we have micro-Newton thrusters forming the control of the actuators. You put all that together and you see it looks very much like LISA. Now the reason we have two cubes on here is essentially one is a witness to the first one. Now if you have a very good clock, how do you know it's a good clock? Well, you compare it to another one, and that's what we are doing here. If we only had one little cube, we tried to measure it, the only thing we'll actually measure is the position of a spacecraft, because the cube is so much quieter than the spacecraft is. So now just to give a little bit of history. Uh, this is going back quite a few years, 1996. Anybody who's got very good eyesight may actually recognize some people here, but this is a list of the people who are still actually working on LISA, and, uh, on LISA Pathfinder in this picture. But if you look very closely, you'll see some familiar faces. Uh, I'm the one at the back. Carson Dansman down here, the PI of the mission, is sitting, I'll point him out, sitting in here in the spacecraft. Harry Ward is somewhere around. Over there. Yep, Harry's there. Dave Robertson is probably also somewhere around, up at the back. And Oliver, who was sitting here a minute ago, has now left. So some of us have had quite a history uh, in this mission from so 96 through here. And also, people like Stefan were also around in those days, but had left, I think, by that point. So it's not in the picture, unfortunately. Yeah. 
However, uh, that was Lisa. So that was the first Lisa Symposium, 1996, in Rutherford Labs. But Lisa Pathfinder came into being in 2000. So we had actually had ideas in the early days, 98 with the first sort of concept of it. But 2000 is when Lisa Pathfinder entered the ESA system. And that happened to coincide with the third uh, Lisa Symposium. And this is the recommendation from the SSAC that says, the SSAC unanimously endorses the executive's proposal to use SMART2 mission as currently scheduled as a timely opportunity to test the technologies which are crucial to Lisa, blah, 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 blah. So the timely part. Well, it was timely, it was only 15 years later, and there we are at uh, Karoo. Pathfinder is sitting behind us, it's sitting in the, the launch tower. And you can see there's some familiar faces again, actually in the, in the first one you can see the, the regular people, there's you know, Harry Ward is here, he's over there, and myself, I'm in there somewhere. But this is all about the life of PI. You know, for the young people in the audience, do you really want to be a PI in a mission? Well, that's a... <laughs> Well, forget the 15 years, that's what happens if you're the PI of a mission. <laughs> you notice the Carsten's still smiling, so it must be good. So what is Pathfinder? So, as all missions in, in ESA, we have a split between the spacecraft and payload. So the spacecraft uh, is provided by ESA through the industrial prime contractor, which is Airbus, DS, and Stevenage. There's probably a bunch of guys over there from Stevenage. And because of the traditional split, things like the, the thrusters and uh, the control system are part of a spacecraft, whereas there's no real distinction in LISA Pathfinder or LISA between what is you know, the control system, the thruster, and the payload. The whole thing acts as one unit and the whole one science instrument. We then have the payloads. So we have a LISA technology package, and that's provided by the member states and ESA. And then with the architect coming from Airbus DS in Friedrichshafen, from Rudiger, sitting here. And here we had the inertial sensors, so these little cubes. Uh, the interferometer, inter, uh, interferometric system in between, and the whole diagnostic package, all these cabling running around here. We also have a disturbance reduction system, uh, which Phil Barella was going to talk about later, and that's provided by NASA JPL. And this is running the processor, the control system, and the thrusters. So I say there's a traditional split on our side, but in the US side it's called a payload. Uh, and Phil tells a lot more about that. And this is where the parts came from. So you see we're all over Europe. Uh, you know, we cover quite a few countries, seven countries, and there's various aspects coming from there. And it's quite, you know, it's interesting to note here, this is a very complex mission. So there's no distinction between a payload and a spacecraft. There's no camera, no camera number one, camera number two, diagnostic number three. This is one instrument. And this is one instrument, complex instrument, coming from these member states, all coming together and working on day one. As Ian said, very first day of operation, this thing works straight out of the box. And we can't stress that enough. This has really been a, a, a wondrous mission and a real to show the collaboration you can get in a complex entity like Pathfinder. So now a little bit of history. We've been around for many years. I'd say the first sort of idea of a, a demonstrator was called Elite. Anyone who's got sharp eyesight will notice that you know, when this was first sent around and people looked at it, this, someone shouted out, there's a spelling mistake in the front page. And of course, everyone laughs. Yeah, of course there is. Well, we've got the demonstration Stalite. If anyone doesn't see it, look at satellite and you'll see. And this is actually a, a, you know, a picture of the front cover. There was a spelling mistake. It goes to show that even with a spelling mistake in the front cover, we still got there. But that was 98. This was then refined and became Smart 2 uh, in around about year 2000. And you can see it was, again, two little cubes sitting in these houses and the optical bench in between. And in those days, this was a part of a bigger entity called the, the, the Darwin Irsay Lisa Pathfinder DRS. It was a kind of a three entities in one mission. And the actual Lisa Pathfinder part of these colored boxes sitting over here. So it's a very small aspect of the, the satellite. Then we go for selection. I guess something more realistic, something that looks like something we can recognize today. Two test masters, optical bench. Uh, we get adopted. It's something that looks even nicer. This time we have the, the Americans also had uh, a test mass and interferometer at that point. Unfortunately, that was descoped. And we're back to uh, Lisa Pathfinder. And then it's something which is very close to flying. And finally, we get the, the flight unit. And that gets integrated. I apologize for the shaky hands here, but whoever's taking the image just held a camera in their hand. And it's, you know, with high zoom, it doesn't work very well. But just to show that it was actually put inside the spacecraft, so we're not lying to you, we give you these wonderful results. Uh, and that was an IBG. So then just about two years ago, just now, the thing was put in the Antonov, the whole spacecraft. Uh, it was shipped out to Kourou. When it arrived, it was rather wet. Uh, luckily, the spacecraft survived. It was in that nice box. However, several computers died as people were carrying their laptops in their backpack 
and the rain was so heavy, it basically fried the computers. So that was a bit of a problem for the, the team over there. This terrified us, when we see this picture, that the whole thing was shipped on its side. So why did it ship it vertical? But, you know, it's going to survive launch, so it can easily survive a flight on its side, and it did. It was then made vertical, final checks. The little spacemen come out, and they put the fuel into the, the tanks. Uh, and then the fairing is closed, and it's all ready to go. And we can do a quick summary of that. This is going to work, yep. So the first thing we have to do is make sure it fits the payload adapter fitting. It then goes into the fairing. You'll see the people in the window getting a bit nervous. The reason they get nervous at this stage is they've worked on this for many years. Many people have worked on this for many, many years. As soon as the fairing closes, you never see it again. The next time the fairing opens, it's on orbit. So it's, it's gone. It gets taken out to its transport module and then goes for a, a nice little trip through the French Guiana uh, jungle. You don't want to have a clean room close to the launch site. If you do that and something goes wrong, then you lose your clean room as well as your launch site. So it's about a 10-kilometer drive. It took a bit of time, we get late at night, and then the terrifying part is you see the whole thing being lifted up in a crane, and that's a bit scary. Obviously, we've done it many times before, it's still a bit scary. It gets put down there, we'll forget a couple of days of hiccups when some bolts didn't work quite right. But it all closed up, and the next time it came out, it was ready to go, it was ready to launch. And then we can't do a talk Dix, about a mission neuf, without this part. Vite. Sept, six, the 3rd of December, 0404 UTC, quatre, trois, off it went. Deux, un, top, allumage et décollage de And it goes very six. fast, this is the fireworks, a solid rocket booster. Uh, we had good weather for most of the time we flew, apart from that day. We had 11 seconds of light, and then that was it. Into the clouds, and we saw it for about a fraction of a second later, but not much more. But it was great, and as we heard in the last talk, we were put into low Earth orbit, 200 by 1,500 kilometers, and then we had to do uh, the six apogee raising maneuvers. I would stress it a bit more than Andreas did, even though Andreas is, you know, it's his team. We had to do four maneuvers within, I think it was 40 hours. I mean, you know, Andreas can keep me right here, but it was very short. And each one of these maneuvers, you have to know where's the spacecraft, what they have to do next, implement it, get the data. It was very intensive. But we got out there. Uh, it took about 50 days to get to L1. We separated from the prop module. I think I may have said that date wrong. I had 2nd of February. Ian had a bit earlier on that. And then our final orbit is about 500,000 by 800,000 kilometers. And at the moment, we are just coming around about where this stops. We've done about three orbits around L1 uh, until today. So what happened? We got there. So that's a, a, a very brief timeline of what happened. So we, we launched, we started commissioning. Now, we didn't have anything like an orbit insertion. So we go out there, we just separate, and we get what we get. So we didn't have to have the worry of, do we capture the orbit? For us, the, the main stressful part was, we have to release these little test masses. So we, we release the launch locks. Well, that's fairly simple. But then we had to release the test mass to make it free-floating. And that's the thing that Ian was showing. And we were quite relieved when this happened. And as you can see, this Could was you now. <laughs> the project manager was thinking, good, I can go home now. So it was, it was good. So then we entered science mode. Uh, we're first entered during commissioning, 22nd of February. We started science operations on the 1st of March. And by the end of the 1st of March, we'd met our requirements. So it was wonderful. We then ran through until uh, June. We handed over to DRS. DRS operated for about three months. We had to actually hand it back and forward over that period. It's a bit longer. Uh, and we started our extended mission in December of last year, and then the end of science operations, 30th of June, and then in about, oh, I don't know what it is, three hours' time, we send the last telecommand, and that's the end, Lisa Pathfinder. So we are a physics lab. We are not a standard astronomy experiment. So what does a physics lab actually mean? And it starts off with most days we get together and we work out what we want to do. So we get experiment planning. And that becomes a human-readable input called the, the agenda file. It may not look human-readable, but that really is a human-readable input. And we hand that over to the, the stock, in our case, Science Technology Operations Center. So normally the SOC or the stock would be based in ESAC in Madrid. But for this mission, everyone was co-located at ESOC. So over here in the PISA room and over next to the, the dedicated control room of Pathfinder. And that was essential for the success of this mission, having everyone close together to discuss things, any issues, we could solve them very quickly. And it really worked. And we gave it to the stock. Stock are mostly engineers, so the guys are sitting here, so forgive me. But they don't trust us, so they simulate it. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, because many times there was mistakes. So that was good. They simulated, we iterated, we got it working. The stock then send everything to the mock. 
you know, we're surrounded by mock here, but mock don't trust anyone, so they simulate it. And <laughs> when they're happy, then good, we can send it to the spacecraft. So everything's up to the spacecraft. It's back down again. We get it in there, so it runs overnight, or actually runs for roughly three days in the future we're running, 24-hour uh, exercises. We get the data, the mock convert it for us, uh, it goes to the data analysis team, did now seem analyze the data and feedback the planning. So for the first six months of the mission, this was happening seven days a week. We were continually getting data, replanning, uh, sending to the spacecraft, and this was really intensive. And would, again, it got to stress, it would only have worked if we're here. It wouldn't have worked if we'd been remote uh, in institutes or back in SDEC. And we did lots of experiments. So this was uh, for a nominal mission. This was roughly what we do, all these colors represent a different experiment. So Stefano's going to go through this. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm just going to mention one part, which maybe Stefano won't, is on their optical metrology system, how well we did there. So two things one to do with Pathfinder. One is, how well can we measure the position of our test masses? And the second one is, how quiet are the test masses? So I'll talk about the measuring, and Stefano will talk about the quietness. So this is the, the optical metrology system of the year 2000, when Pathfinder Smart 2 was first envisaged. And this is a bit unusual, because this is a fairly complicated system, uh, and the actual flight system is much simpler. So in the, the one on the left, we have things like a reference cavity, we have Faraday isolators, polarizers, EOMs. The one on the right is just mirrors and beam splitters. So it's nice to see that things don't always get more complicated, they actually sometimes get a bit simpler. And that's our OMS. And that's what it looks like uh, in real life. We have a zero-door bench with little mirrors bonded onto the surface. This bonding is a hydroxycatalysis bonding. Uh, and it forms things like a chemical bond. So it's a very, it looks very fragile, but it's actually extremely strong. You can't get these mirrors off. And this is the University of Glasgow developed this system. And actually, if you look straight through here, you can actually see the test mass. That's about the only time you could ever see the test mass. That's you sitting at test mass number two, looking at test mass number one. And one of the things we're very worried about is taking a precision interferometer, putting it in space, and hoping that nothing moves. So we're quite convinced that the, the bonding was good, but good is good in a lab, but is it good when it's up there? So one thing we can do is we can use some of these paths on a bench which don't actually go to the test masses, and we can see how much did the beam move between the ground and space. And this is a kind of complicated table here, but really what you want to look at is the column called IEBG, that was tested inside the spacecraft uh, in the test campaign, and then flight. And that's the position of the, the spot on our photo detectors. And the biggest motion we got was about 14 micron change in one of the the second ones. You can see some of the other ones about nine microns. And this is probably not the light moving. This is probably actually the detector moving. Because, you know, we only see it. If, it, if a beam had wandered up and down, you'd have seen that in every signal. But we actually only see it on one of them. So the glue joint is probably a bit loose, but the rest of it, the actual bench itself, has been pristine. So what do we actually measure? Well, this was a Pathfinder requirement, nine picometers per root hertz. So it's this funny per root hertz number we use, we just remember the nine picometers. Over the lifetime of Pathfinder, LISA became a bit more stringent. I went to 1.4 picometers per hertz. So we're saying, well, we, we hopefully we can meet the Pathfinder requirements. If we're lucky, we'll meet the LISA requirements, then we can tick that box off. So we measured the noise again on day number one. We measured the noise. And we were much better. Now, this is quite a complicated chart to look at because it looks over here as if we don't meet the requirement. But the only thing we're seeing here is the test mass is moving because we can't measure this until we make the test masses free. Then the test masses jiggle around. So the only thing we actually measure is the test mass motion. What we can do is look at the right-hand side where well, there's no test mass motion because of inertia. Uh, so if this line was up here, we'd have met the requirements. If it had been here, we'd have met the least of the requirements, but it's down here. It's down at the order of 30 femtometers per root hertz. So rather than picometers, we're doing femtometers. One femtometer is roughly the size of a proton. So it's a ph phenomenal measurement. So we're 300 times better than requirements. Now, sometimes, maybe not Martin, but Thomas Pasfogo used to always shout and saying, this, this is over-engineered, you wasted money. I said, so, well, that was the best measurement we ever made on ground before we launched. Uh, and again, it just shows you how quiet space is. This is a measurement you can do in space. You just can't do these kind of measurements on the ground. Even though we thought we could measure the interferometer beforehand, you can't. The ground is just too noisy. And this is to show you that you know, this, this is our noise budget for the interferometer. And this big line running up here, why we see the noise increasing, the low frequency, this is basically the molecule bouncing off the test masses, which Stefan will come to call the Brownian noise, and that's what limits our performance at the low frequency in terms of the, the interferometer. So we're not, it's not the sensing noise affecting us, it's just the motion of the thing we're measuring. And this, this has been stable throughout the whole mission. So it's not as if it was very good one single day, and then it got worse the next day. It's just been constant across uh, the whole uh, time we've been here. All these lines you see jumping up, that's because we've been doing experiments which are making it, deliberately making it worse. 
So just to finish off, uh, I would like to give, from my side, thanks and congratulations to the whole Lisa Pathfinder team. This is not one or two people doing this. And this is quite a nice picture because it shows we have people here coming from their CESA for the project manager, uh, people from the project team, from the flight control team, from industry, science, the PIs, some of the postdocs, and various people. This was really everybody in this picture was responsible for making this mission a success. So it's not one or two people. So thanks to, to all of you guys. I'll finish off uh, with this. This was the start of the science operations. You know, we were quite happy. And the, the 1st of March at 0800 UTC uh, with a wee bit of champagne. And now we'll hand over to Stefano, who's going to tell us about the end. So maybe champagne later on, I think, for this one. Thank you. <laughs> and I should say, this is a life in a piece. That's what the piece actually looked like. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everybody. So the original title of this presentation was, thank you. The original title of this presentation was the PI perspective, and then he changed in the program. And uh, if I have just to give you the PI perspective, it's easy. It was a well done job, and we are really satisfied. Uh, if you want a little bit more details, I have to. Uh, start from where Paul at some point was, that uh, what we have learned from Einstein is that gravity is not an ordinary force, or it's not pulling things, it's curving space-time, right? We, we, we had to adapt to the idea that even the uh, rays of light that are very straight things uh, curve around a massive body. A more mundane manifestation of curvature is the fact that uh, free particles in space next to an heavy body start to curve. Their trajectory are curved. They're not any more straight lines uh, uh, done at, at constant velocity. Uh, what maybe people don't notice very much is that if you, one of the manifestations of the fact that the orbits are curved is that if you look at one particle from the other one, you see the other one accelerating. And actually, the acceleration, the relative acceleration of the two particles is the only manifestation of curvature if you cannot see the source of any other reference. If you take the source out, like in this cartoon, the only thing you see is a particle accelerating, where you go next to a big body that creates curvature. And actually, in this cartoon, I'm also hinting the most practical way to measure this relative acceleration, which is bouncing light out of one of the particles and seeing the color changing because of the Doppler effect. And that's, in essence, how you measure curvature and gravity. And uh, gravitational wave are wave of curvature, and you detect gravitational wave by looking at acceleration, relative acceleration of distant particles. So a gravitational wave detector is put free particle in motion in space and look if they accelerate. If they accelerate, there is curvature passing by. Um, we are not the only one using this technique to measure curvature. Uh, GRACE, the, the experiment to map the gravitational field of the Earth, uses the same technique. Two test masses and a light beam in between in which you, you measure the Doppler shift. This is more or less the, the speedometer of the police, right? It's, they send a, uh, an electromagnetic beam on you and collect the beam, the reflected beam. Cassini, the radio science experiment in Cassini, grazing the sun, is the same uh, concept. So LISA is a bit more complicated. You cannot really fry two test masses in free space. You have to carry things with you. So you have uh, test masses inside the spacecraft, and you send a light beam from the test mass to the spacecraft, the spacecraft to the other spacecraft, and so on, as uh, Paul told you. And uh, in principle, it's very easy to put a test mass in free fall in space, right? Uh, you see the astronaut playing with his little ball in the space station. However, if you look carefully at the balls, they continuously move. And sooner or later, they hit the wall, right? So if you want to fly for a long time a test mass free in a spacecraft, you have to do this trick of measuring where the test mass is inside the spacecraft and turn on thruster to have the spacecraft following the test mass. And uh, this is a, a key element of the LISA scheme, where the test mass is inside the spacecraft, the act as a shield, but the spacecraft has continuously followed the test mass and recenter on the test mass to avoid collision, basically. And uh, to be completely honest with you, 
the spacecraft follow the test mass in one direction, which is the direction in which you measure, you send the beam, but in all other direction, there is not, nothing you can do, and you have to push a little bit the test mass with some little force that you generate with electrical field. So you see these test masses here, is, uh, this is the same as the, the Lisa Pathfinder test mass, it's a cube of gold platinum, two kilos. It fits into this, uh, uh, box here, it doesn't touch the box, has millimeter on all sides and is surrounded by little electrodes that are used to apply an electric field and give little force to, uh, to keep the, center, the test mass centered relative to the satellite in all direction except the one on which you measure uh, the gravitational wave. Obviously, LISA is made of three of these complement, two test masses and a, and a beam, and if you want to see how we thought LISA could look like before the last CDF study, <laughs> you see that uh, it, the, the light from a distant spacecraft is collected by a telescope. It, it, the, the light goes onto this optical bench that uh, Paul was mentioning. This, this optical bench is the equivalent of the big building of LIGO. All the optics is in, uh, on an optical bench, and, and on the back of the optical bench, eventually the light reaches the test mass and, and make the final measurement. Now, the problem is, that you would like test mass to accelerate because space-time is curved. But test mass can accelerate for more mundane reasons. In this cartoon, I try to capture gas molecules on steroids because they aren't so big, hitting the test mass and accelerating the test mass relative to a flat background, and you would see the same thing. If you shoot your police speedometer, you see acceleration, you say, hey, gravitational wave, but it's just uh, molecules, right? And so you have a requirement. Those disturbances must be lower than a certain limit. And now I'll spend a little technical moment on this limit. So this picture is, a, is the LISA requirement and is a spectrum. Spectrum means that this line, uh, oops, this line, if you meet this line at this frequency, you measure a signal, the smallest signal that uh, acceleration signal that LISA can detect is proportional to this line. And uh, being noise, uh, the lower it is, the better off you are, right? The smaller the noise, the more sensitive is your detector, right? So we want to be below that line. LISA must be, the performance of LISA must be below that line, okay? Now, to put the thing in context, frequencies here are very low, right? The lowest frequency I will show you are the inverse of half a day. So we are talking gravitational wave that keeps half a day, you go for lunch, quiet full, you do the siesta, and you come back, and the, and the wave is coming on the other side, right? Up to waves that last 10 seconds, right? So it's a, a broad spectrum. And if you want to put the thing in context, this number here, this 10 to the minus 14 meter per second square, as an acceleration, is a million of a billion of the acceleration of gravity. If you want to convert in a force, it's the weight of a virus in your hand, right? So it's a very small force. Uh, this is one of the scale where each tick is a factor 10, right? So if you go one tick up, you're, you're worse by factor 10 uh, and a factor 100. This cannot be tested on ground. If you try to do free falling test masses on ground, they free fall, boom, on the floor, right? That's the end of the experiment. And if you look at what people, we are, as I said, we are not the only one uh, comparing uh, free-falling test masses. If you look what has been done in space, the best, thing, the best thing now is microscope, which is a beautiful French mission testing the equivalence principle. And you may see that, uh, oops, this doesn't work, it's about light. Uh, the line, the requirement for microscope, actually this is not required, this is the performance achieved, is a thousand times less demanding of what we need in LISA. And that was the problem, right? So LISA ah, is a wonderful project, but can it be done, right, at all? Okay. So the, as, as uh, Paul was saying, the, the concept of LISA Pathfinder was simple. Because the disturbance that shake your test mass out of their perfect uh, trajectory are generated locally in the satellite, you can do a test locally. You don't need the one million kilometers. So you can take these two test masses, 
put them in a single spacecraft, make, make the arm length instead of five million kilometer, uh, 40 centimeter, put in a single spacecraft, put an interferometer between them to measure the relative acceleration and you're done. In reality, we have two interferometers because we want also to play the trick of measuring the position of the spacecraft relative to the test mass and fire the little rocket to follow the test mass. So we have two interferometers. Uh, Unfortunately, while in LISA, the two, in, the two satellites chase their own test masses. Here, the test masses are in the same t uh, satellite, so you cannot chase both at the same time. So you chase one and the other one. I'm sorry to admit, we push a little bit with a little bit of electrical force. And this is a problem. It's a problem because we have to correct in the data, but it's a problem because it's a source of noise. And so we were expecting to be limited by this source of noise. And this is one of the things uh, I will uh, uh, discuss later, talking of performance. So you know, you, by now you know the story. We took two of these test masses, went to L1, because it's quieter. The near-Earth orbit, there is too much gravitational gradient, so you cannot use. This two gold platinum test mass that you see there is gold platinum because it's very dense. It's, uh, uh, a test mass like this is two kilo. This uh, very high stability optical bench that carries all the optics, and we needed other things. We needed the electrode housing, the electrode surrounding the test mass to apply the little force. We have to carry ultraviolet light because these test masses are floating in space, irradiated by cosmic ray, they charge up, and there is no wire to ground, right? So you, we have to illuminate with ultraviolet light and move electrons, steer electrons around to neutralize the test mass, and uh, this infamous caging mechanism, right, to block the test mass at launch, and uh, believe it or not, to handle the vacuum on ground, we also needed everything to be closed in a vacuum enclosure that then we vented to space once in orbit. So this is uh, your only chance to see the real flight hardware, because as you know, tonight we are going to kiss it goodbye. So this is the test mass in paraphernalia, what we call the gravity reference sensor, being assembled uh, at uh, CGS in uh, Milan, actually in Tortona. It's a test mass, but it's also a mirror in an optical system. So all alignments are micron level alignments, right? And this alignment works very well as uh, worked marvelously this technique of building an optical structure by gluing the optical component with, uh, with uh, sodium hydroxide that form again the mirror. So this complicated structure of glass has the same mechanical property as it was were machined from the bulk. And this is a jewel done at the uh, University of Glasgow. This is how it looks assembled. And this gives you an impression of the full complement integrated with all the hardness and everything in this way to be closed for good inside the space. There are many moments that are for good, right? We, we saw this, uh, this package in, 2000, this is 2015, is the beginning of 2015, and when the guy put a cover on the central cylinder of the satellite, we didn't see this thing again. So you see here being integrated in the satellite. Anyhow, as Paul said, we launched, as, as everybody has said here, we launched in December, uh, we cruised, we released the test mass so that we have the famous Cesar Garcia dance that is now very popular. To be honest, this is one thing that didn't work by the book. The test mass was supposed to be released and be captured immediately. It bounced a few times, we had to adjust the tank. Uh, we had a few moments where, uh, to be honest, I, I wasn't very happy. But even that we have fixed. You know, over the last uh, month, uh, Jose and Ian and all the people in the mock have played with this uh, system. And the latest release of the test mass are by the book. What you see here are the three coordinates. Sorry, the three coordinates of the test mass. You can. You can read the vertical scale is microns, and they are released at some point in some position, and, they, and the control system captured them to zero in a very smooth way with no bouncing. So this worked. The operation were really smooth. The dynamics of the system were really smooth. We have to capture, we have to start this drug free where the satellite follow the test mass and suspend the other one and push a little 
you push a little to have the other following, never done before, all done on paper and simulation, and as soon as we start them, what you see here is a plot of the force we have to apply to the test mass to keep it standing. So we start with a big force, and then we go into, we go into the drug free here, and things become calmer, and the spacecraft is following the test mass smoothly, and then uh, we transition to this low noise, and you don't see anything. The, the force that was nanonewton has become femtonewton. You don't see anything, and the system is very quiet. And, okay, I'll keep, I think I, I have to speed up. <coughs> so, what we did, what we achieved. These are the requirements of LISA, right? It's the same plot as before in a, in a different scale. <coughs> Now, because a single satellite experiment is more noisy, it was expected to be more noisy, the requirements for LISA Pathfinder were very much relaxed. They were relaxed at a factor 10 in amplitude because it was more noisy. And even more, <coughs> they were relaxed by a large factor in frequency. We were requested only to show performance at a millihertz, 20 minutes, a millihertz is 20 minutes, because testing over the hour is expensive. And so to cut the time of testing, we said, okay, if you demonstrate your performance at a millihertz, we are happy. The only departure from this is that uh, we, we could have done with a much worse interferometer, but what the hell, we have to do an interferometer for LISA, and so we decided to fly anyhow a picometer per hertz class interferometer. Okay, what were we expecting? The people say, hey, you over-designed, you got more than... What were we expecting? We had a long error budget. We have done a lot of testing. For over a decade, for instance, we have tested small forces acting on the surface of test masses by making the test masses of Lisa Pathfinder the member of what is called a torsion pendulum. So in the horizontal plane, it's a rather uh, sensitive thing. So you, one of these yellow things is like as the same surface as the test mass of Elizabeth Finder, and it's surrounded by all the disturbing affair. So we, we looked if the uh, torsion pendulum was quiet. I don't, I'm not going into the details. But we could test all the physical effect we knew would disturb the test masses. And we could even put an upper limit to what we could not predict, which is this line here which is very close to the Lisa Pathfinder requirement. So we flew with a substantial risk reduction that Lisa Pathfinder would have completely failed because we could put, in some ingenious way, upper limit to what we didn't know. And according to our calculation, we should have been dominated by two effects. The first effect comes from the fact that you have to push the test mass, as I said before. Now, you apply a force with an electrical field, but the electrical field are noisy, and so your force is noisy. And the more the force you have to apply, the more the force is noisy, right? So it depends on how much, how much noise you will get, depends on how much force you have to compensate. And actually, I'm not going into detail, it depends on the setting, on how much force you are prepared to compensate. The second source we thought we would see <coughs> is Brownian noise, which is th there is gas around the test mass, so we pump like hell, but there is still some gas. The gas molecule collide with the test mass and they shake the test mass and make noise. It's a small molecule, but there are many. And so we were expecting to be dominated by this thing. We calculated how much we expected. You see here the different contribution, but to cut the story short, we thought we should be on the black dashed line. And on March 1st, we were here. So we weren't taken by surprise. We were exactly on the spot, except for the interferometer, which was too good, 100 times good. And so you don't see the razor at high frequency due to the interferometer, because the interferometer is basically irrelevant. You don't see it, right? So, OK, it's Brownian noise and the fact that we are applying this force, and this force is noisy. And are we applying the right force? So how much force we were prepared to apply? Well, why you apply a force at all? The reason is that on board the spacecraft, there is a gravitational field. Most of the gravitational field is this guy here attracting this test mass and vice versa, right? And so we were very brave. 
what we did, we measured the field created by all the spacecraft. What you see on the left is a log of all the components, where they are, how much they weigh. We calculate the field, and we machine a heavy, a heavy mass that we put on the other side of the test mass. If you're wrong, you're doomed. Okay? And so we were happy. We thought that the precision of all this calculation was such that we could compensate to a nanonewton. We, we would be zero plus or minus a nanonewton. And so we set the system to compensate a nanonewton. But we went up and we measured 25 pico newton. So again, another factor 20 or 30 better. So we could reduce the authority and going from a force of 650 to a force of 25 or 50, and that's what we got, right? And that's the, the result we published in June, because we have basically got the LISA requirement with this little trick. You may notice that in the meanwhile, also the Brownian noise, the one due to the molecule collision with the molecule, has gone down. Has gone down because this uh, can is uh, connected through a hose to the other space, keep pumping, like in the lab, you have the pump pumping, and the pressure goes down and goes down and goes down. So you see the Brownian noise, this is a picture that shows the Brownian noise, this is a, the most expensive pressure gauge you can think of, right? So this is the pressure around, measured through the Brownian noise going down as it does when you open a pump on a vacuum can and wait <laughs> a few months, right? So then, in, in the meanwhile, the pressure was going down, and so when we started the extension, we were already at a lower level. And the final thing, the final perfect, good, magnificent run we perform is in February, is the red line. And if you average a little bit the data points, that is our spectrum. And you may see that now we are a substantial factor better than the LISA requirement. So, do we understand this? Partly. For the time being, we can account for a third of this noise or half of this noise. We are working, we will work for months on the data we already have to understand if we understand everything, but still the performance is such that if we reproduce this system, uh, Lisa is done with big margin. We have done other things, but I think I'm running short, so we have published other paper. But more paper are in the pipeline, so this mission will produce many physical review letters. It's an easy prediction. The data are fantastic and are historic. No one has data like this. And if you want to summarize what we have achieved, well, we have now demonstrated that we can do three orders of magnitude better than anything that has been done in space in the same field. So I think it's a, a big leap in space-time metrology. If you want to understand what this means for LISA, this is a simulation. The blue signal is the, signal, the acceleration signal between two test masses of LISA that you would have if you have two black holes of half a million solar mass spinning at the edge of the universe, 12 billion here from now. The red line is the noise of Lisa Pathfinder, which doesn't look noise at all unless, unless you zoom in. And so you see that this, this big leap in space-time metrology means that Lisa is a precision instrument. It's not like LAGO detecting the thing. It's becoming a deep, a deep universe, high precision instrument for supermassive sources and large sources in the universe. So, we also made the front pages of a few things, not as many as LIGO, and uh, the tone of all the front pages is green light for Lisa, and indeed, I think this was a green light for Lisa, because he's uh, in real time issued the call for L3, and uh, on last, last month, uh, we, uh, the SPC, I was in the SPC at the time, uh, selected Lisa as the L3 mission. And, and you know, the schedule and I'm not going to go into this uh, detail. So if I, have, if I can summarize a few things, I think this is a bit of an historic mission because we have done many firsts. It's the first space mission in the field of gravitational waves, no doubt. It's the first drug-free gradiometer out of the Earth, you know, at, at distance on the Earth, and it's certainly the first 
a high precision gradiometer with an interferometric uh, reading of the displacement is the is the first drag free mission away from the earth is the first ESA mission in the field of, gra of gravitation at large and uh, i think this game of the first can continue for for a while I concur completely, and I want to stress uh, what uh, Paul said. In this instrument, including LISA, there is no separation between instrument and spacecraft. And that has a sociological consequence, that uh, engineers, people from the agency, students, scientists, they have to work together, and we did. And the environment of ESOC was the perfect environment to, to work together. And, and, uh, and the fact that the maneuvering the test masses and the satellite, an essential part of the science operation, makes AOCS and MOC inside the, the scientific operation of an instrument like this. So I cannot, you know, I concur verbatim with these words by the project manager, Cesar Garcia, who asked me to convey this message. This has been an incredible experience of team working. Not everything was perfect. Uh, working conditions sometimes were harsh, and interpersonal relations tense, as you may see from this picture on the Bodensee with the Friedrich Safen people and other people. The initial team building was really painful. This is a, a famous gathering in Trento in, a, in an 18th century villa, uh, trying to build a team, desperate. Uh, the interaction at technical level was also, you know, difficult, as you may see from people from Zurich and Trento and ESA and Friedrich Safen working to make measurements together, and a, a bit of lack of enthusiasm in the science team also. But, uh, yeah, this is another aspect. We had to do very sophisticated dynamical simulation of the system with no support from ESA. You may notice that the pen is the laser beam. And the two test masses, you can have them. These are made out of foam. And uh, they, they prove very useful in the, in the PISA. Yeah, we had to do the data analysis on a stair. I think this gives a, a good picture of the enthusiastic team of young people and not so young people working to the data analysis in real time of this mission. This is the first mission with the data analysis in real time, maybe, maybe. But seriously speaking, the operations were fantastic. And uh, I'm sure I'm talking also for Carson, saying that we are already missing them. And uh, we will uh, dearly miss it. On a, on a more sad tone, I must say that we, we, we were sorry. We had very uh, bad losses during this project. Maybe that's because the project is very long. We, we have lost Alberto Lobo and Pierre Binetri that uh, uh, were instrumental for the project of for Lisa. They carried Spain and France into this endeavor. And, and we have lost Rudiger Reinhardt, without which fundamental physics in ESA, we would not be here, right? He, he made a big effort. And so I think we collect, I'm sure I'm speaking on the behalf of the entire team, dedicating the mission to these three colleagues that uh, we dearly miss. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I think uh, Lisa Pathfinder has done his job. It's time to let it go, because I think he has put uh, Lisa solidly within the science program, of which we are all proud, and so let's move on with Lisa and the science program. Thank you. Wondering if I'm gonna be able to pull this off here. We'll see with a wireless USB connector. You got it? Ah, there we are. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Phil Barilla, and I'm the project manager for the NASA JPL contribution to uh, the Lisa Pathfinder mission. Sorry, I walk so. Uh, first order of business is just a, a, a heartfelt congratulations uh, to ESA on a, on a miraculous, uh, wonderfully executed mission. And uh, we're from NASA and JPL, excuse me, congratulations. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job. Uh, the execution and operations was phenomenal. I've been on uh, several projects and you guys just carried out a, a wonderful uh, mission and we were so happy to be a part of it. 
I, I do have to tell you, if you look at any large endeavor, uh, there's typically a team behind that large endeavor. Very seldom do you see one person or a, even a handful. And we had a, a great team, not only at JPL and at NASA, but uh, over here uh, with the ESA team, uh, including the ESA prime contractor, Astrium. I see Dave Wealthy in the group there. And, and to give you a sense, I mean, I, I loved going through the history with, uh, that Paul presented and, and Stefano. Uh, we started at JPL, the project, the, the NASA JPL project, in late 2002, early 2003. Uh, I came on board in 2005, and so it's been a long journey for us. Um, and as you can imagine, similar to NISA, it's technology development. This is a technology demonstration. So for NASA and JPL, what this means is that we hoped to learn, not only in operations, but during development, we hope to learn the, the challenges of this technology. I mean, taking concepts off a whiteboard, building prototypes, qualifying it for space, and actually operating it. And you, as you can imagine, uh, we ran into a number of, of bumps in the road along the way during development. Um, I remember Jacques Louet in 2006 at our CDR. For those of you that remember Jacques Louet, he's retired now. Uh, he sternly warned me. The first time I met him, I, I went to shake his hand, and he, stir he didn't shake my hand, but he sternly pointed his finger at me. He said, you better deliver on time, or I'm going to throw you off the spacecraft. I was happy he retired the following year and, uh, and didn't see our one-year delay in our, in our delivery. But there were, there were a number of uh, bumps in the roads that our technical team uh, overcame. Uh, there were a number of, number of bumps in the roads during operations that uh, we overcame as well. And without uh, Andreas and Damian and, and uh, Ian and uh, the Aztec team, uh, Paul McNamara, uh, just world-class team, uh, really helped us. Uh, and we couldn't have done it without you. So, uh, and that's an understatement. And those, for those of you who know what was going on in operations and the workarounds that we had to enact uh, to make it successful. Uh, it really is an understatement. So the collaboration was just phenomenal. And one of the messages I deliver back at NASA uh, when I get a chance to present about ST7 is just that. Uh, we had a, a wonderful team, and you guys were, were great and very supportive uh, when we needed you most. So thank you. OK, I'm going to uh, present a few charts. And I'm going to hand it over to uh, Colleen Maurice Redding, who is uh, in, the back of, in the back of the room there. And Colleen is our propulsion technologist. Uh, she led our extended mission, taking over for John Ziemer. Many of you know John Ziemer. And um, she'll give you some of the details of the operations. Uh, hopefully, I didn't leave anybody out, but just a, a, a great team here. OK, so I, I'm not going to belabor the teaming, but I, as you can see, that's a central theme here for us. Uh, we're so happy and, and honored to have been able to participate in the LISA Pathfinder mission. Uh, it, we're ecstatic not only with your success, we're ecstatic with what we learned, and having the opportunity to uh, work on this technology and, and take this concept off the whiteboard, actually qualify for space, and then operate it. Uh, tremendous success uh, for NASA and JPL. Uh, back home, we had BUSIC, which was responsible for our uh, thruster development with uh, JPL uh, technical support. Uh, we, we flew a RAD 750. Uh, many missions at uh, JPL have a RAD 750 dedicated to the entire spacecraft. And so that's the kind of processing horsepower we had. Uh, to be fair, we didn't need it all initially. But because of the workaround that we had to enact during operations, we're very happy we had it. It's, it saved the day uh, having that RAD 750 uh, for the ST-7. Goddard Space Flight Systems, another excellent partner, was responsible for the algorithm development, the dynamic control system. And then, of course, JPL doing slice software, the thruster development with BUSIC, structures, cabling, and what have you. Uh, we went through our delivery review in June of 2008. Uh, we installed on the spacecraft, I think, September, October 2009 timeframe. And then the team, as, as teams do, uh, went off and, and did other things for a while. And so one of the main challenges that we had was keeping the core competency together at JPL and NASA. As you can imagine, going into operations with a very complex instrument payload like this uh, not just that you can't just call somebody you know, a month before operations and ask them to step in. And fortunately, we were. Many of us have gone and worked three. I've worked three other projects since I delivered, uh, went through our delivery review in 2008. Uh, but we were able to keep that continuity and, uh, and the core people. We had some new people come in, but the core people were part of the team. Uh, I got to mention again Airbus. Uh, Dave Wealthy back there has just been a, a wonderful partner and, and part of the team. And of course, ESA. And when I say ESA, I mean STEC, ESOC, ESAC. Hopefully, I'm not forgetting anybody. But uh, all through the development, just a, a great team. Now, I mentioned we started in 2003 as a project at JPL in earnest. So you can imagine that's 14 years. It's kind of like growing up with a, a sibling, right? A brother, sister. 
you're going to fight. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be some conflict. And so we tried, uh, before launch, actually, we tried to resolve uh, conflict in a, in a more amicable way than, than sending emails and, and being mad at each other. And so this is at my house. And you see Paul McNamara here playing pool in the project science support at JPL, uh, Kurt Cutler. And uh, we thought it'd be a fun idea because we wanted more operating time than, than what we had. And we thought it'd be a fun game to challenge the project scientists at some pool and also the project manager, Caesar, as well and say, hey, if we win, uh, we get some more operating time. So let me just give you some advice. If Paul ever challenges you to play pool in anything, don't do it. Uh, he is a phenomenal pool player, and, and I'm not quite sure where he gained, I guess, all the years in grad school in the uh, pool hall, but uh, he won. Nonetheless, ESA was still very, uh, uh, very generous uh, with the operating time and actually gave us uh, more. Uh, when I prepared these charts, I wasn't quite sure who was going to be here uh, in the audience, but. Uh, I thought it was fair to talk about micronewton level thrust and what that means in, in, simple, in simple terms. Uh, even at JPL, when we're in a room full of engineers and uh, you start talking about position control and thruster noise in root hertz, nanometer per root hertz increments, you know, the eyes start to roll in the back of the head. And when you start to, even 30 micronewtons, when you talk about our maximum thrust of 30 micronewtons or our minimum thrust of five and a half micronewtons, yeah, you understand the units, but you know, just understanding what that really means and 0.1 micronewton control authority. So we, we put together some simple cartoons that we've used over the years. Uh, 30 micronewtons in a 1G environment, which is the maximum design thrust that we designed our thrusters for, is effectively equivalent to lifting a three milligram grain of sand. Or put another way, uh, equal to the mass of your average mosquito. I'm not sure if that's before feeding or, or after, but... Now that's great, that's the maximum thrust, and in fact during operations we actually saw 60 micronewtons on, on several of our thrusters. We did a test that was fairly risky, we didn't want to do it until the extended mission, and we doubled that, so we were very happy about that. But the real claim to fame of this uh, propulsion system that uh, we delivered is the control authority in 0.1 micronewtons. So from about 5.5 micronewtons up to 30 micronewtons, our control authority is in 0.1 micronewtons. And so that's about the mass of the antenna on that same mosquito. And so I think it really it helps, it helps most people understand we're talking about a very precise propulsion system. And as Paul and Stefano told you, what Lisa Pathfinder attempted to do and what Lisa needs to do in keeping that spacecraft still, you have to have that kind of control. And so we're very related. Uh, we demonstrated it and uh, showed that we could meet all of our level ones. And Colleen will talk to you more about that in just a moment. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this photo, but I just wanted to describe the, uh, you'll see uh, this photo here and, and this photo, or this cartoon, is meant to be one of our cluster heads. We have, uh, what you see on, mounted on the spacecraft there is what we call a, a cluster, a thruster cluster, and that's four thruster heads. There's one mounted on the opposing side of the Lisa Pathfinder spacecraft as well. Each one of those uh, clusters you can see there has four thruster heads. Each thruster has nine emitters, so we have a total of 72 emitters. And uh, the avionics uh, RAD 750 I described earlier is mounted inside. And um, I think that's all I'm going to say about that chart there. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to, I, I highlighted earlier the, the bumps in the road that we hit and the innovative excellence really back uh, with our team, our entire team. Uh, it was a tough road. And uh, to get this propulsion system from what was a concept, we started a research activity back in 2001. Uh, and to Colleen and her, her group were part of that. Um, to take it to flight qualification level and then to operations level, it was truly a technology development, uh, one of the hardest things I've ever delivered uh, in my career. So it was uh, a, a really, truly uh, excellent uh, technology development program by the folks back at BUSIC and JPL and, and the whole team. The good news, we met all of our level ones. So level ones in the, in the NASA vernacular are how they grade a project. So before launch, uh, your level ones are established and NASA says you're successful, 100% successful as a project if you meet the following requirements. We met all of our requirements. And so for the project, that's just uh, excellent. And again, we're ecstatic. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Colleen and she's gonna describe a little bit more about the level ones and the other operations. Thank you. So this slide, um, the data in this slide shows that we met uh, the level one uh, requirement of position stability. So is this, um, the data in blue here shows um, that we delivered the requirement, which was 10, uh, 10 nanometers per root hertz 
um, and this is the, um, the requirement um, shown in red, and we um, demonstrate that with, with margin. So that was the most important um, requirement that we had to meet. Um, the second one was the thrust noise. So the data here shows um, that we met the thrust noise requirement. So it's shown here um, in red of 0.1 micronewton per root hertz. Um, and we met that um, with margin, um, more margin um, in some frequencies. Uh, we did this in a, um, an accelerometer mode, so that's using the test masses um, as accelerometers um, uh, to, measure the, to measure the thrust. Uh, we did this, the experiment was run with um, 23 um, millihertz uh, signal injections to the thruster, so this is an artifact of the, um, the test and the way we ran it. Um, it's not actually the thrust noise. So that shows we met um, the, the second uh, most significant level one requirement. So to add to the first for this mission, uh, we demonstrated um, uh, electrospray thrusters, the colloid thrusters, for the first time. Um, it's incredibly exciting um, to us because we had been working on them uh, for quite a while. They've been um, under development um, all around the world for tens of years. So this was incredibly exciting that uh, we finally had a mission that actually required um, this technology and were able to demonstrate it. Um, we met the, our propulsion requirements um, in flight. The objective for the thrust range for the thrusters was 5 to 30 micronewtons. Um, we demonstrated uh, 5 to 30 micronewtons on all the thrusters and up to um, 50 on one thruster and 60 micronewtons on another thruster. The precision requirement was 0.1 uh, micronewton, um, and we demonstrated that um, also in flight. Thrust noise requirement, 0.1 micronewtons per root hertz. We demonstrated that in flight. Um, on seven thrusters, one of the thrusters, um, uh, thruster one, had one needle that was flickering off and on, um, so that created um, a higher noise level. Um, that was about 0.8 micronewtons uh, per root hertz. Uh, so um, the thrust range uh, response time, so that's the time to go from five micronewtons to 30 micronewtons. Um, the requirement on that was uh, 100 seconds. On the ground test, we demonstrated that within 10 seconds on all eight uh, thrusters. Um, in flight, we demonstrated on seven thrusters, in thruster eight um, uh, also had a slower response time of about 146 seconds. The operational lifetime, um, there was a point it was 90 days, then it was reduced to 60 days um, because it was, um, uh, it was delivered and then was sitting um, on the spacecraft for um, seven years. Uh, uh, that, that requirement was also relaxed, um, so it was just that we, the requirement for lifetime was any measurable thrust on orbit. Uh, so there were, th uh, there were tests done on the ground um, for uh, 3,478 hours. Um, all thrusters, um, all seven of the thrusters demonstrate over 2,400 hour, 2, hours uh, in space, um, which is 100 days. Um, and uh, one thruster, thruster four, that was mentioned earlier that shorted out, uh, demonstrated 1,690 hours, which is about uh, 70 days. So this is um, exciting for us because this is a, the demonstration of a new, uh, a new propulsion technology, electrospray thrusters. There were some issues that um, were mentioned, uh, but we, uh, we think we know how to address them um, and develop the technology further for, um, for missions um, like LISA or um, uh, for precision pointing for exoplanet observatories is another, um, uh, uh, another application for it. Uh, so this is a summary of our experiments um, in the primary mission, which was about 90 days. Um, we conducted about 14 experiments, so this is to show you that we used our time wisely. Um, we're so grateful for all the support we had from everybody, um, especially um, Ian and Jose. Um, by the end of the primary mission, we joked that Jose knew how to run our thrusters as well as we did, um, and so he was uh, helping us out to develop the experiments um, and run them. Uh, we had uh, about 15 experiments in the um, uh, extended mission. All of our experiments fit, uh, fit into three um, kind of primary, three categories, uh, drag-free control um, uh, demonstration, performance, and then improvements and optimization, uh, thruster performance demonstration, um, uh, characterization and improvements, and uh, thruster performance model validation. So we needed, to, so C1 was our first experiment that demonstrated our, uh, our level one requirement of the thrust noise, precision, um, uh, pre uh, position noise. Uh, it also demonstrated all of our uh, modes. Uh, we had six modes, uh, standby, attitude, uh, zero G, accelerometer, uh, drag free, uh, 18 DOF, transitional and 18 DOF. So those were all demonstrated with that one experiment. Um, we did uh, many other experiments. Uh, C2 was basically uh, measuring the, the test mass actuation response. So that was, um, that was important in, um, in calibrating um, the, um, the position measurements. Uh, we had some um, issues uh, with those measurements. They weren't precise enough um, in a, um, 
uh, not in a, a high resolution mode. So we're very grateful that we got to run the extended mission because we were able to run um, those calibrations, rerun the calibrations um, in a wider range, um, in a higher uh, resolution mode. Um, because we need to calibrate uh, the inertial sensor on all axes. So we're able to do that. Um, we needed a flight software modification for that. Uh, but that enabled us then to do um, measurements um, where we would inject signals into thrusters and we could actually measure the thrust uh, using the, uh, the test masses as accelerometers. We could measure the, uh, the thrust levels of all the thrusters. And that enabled us then to uh, validate our thruster performance model, which I'll show you is, is very simple. Um, we did uh, many other experiments. Um, uh, we did uh, experiments to run on only seven thrusters, which turned out to be important in the extended mission because we needed to run with only seven thrusters. Um, as mentioned, we had four, four coal gas thrusters were running um, in, a, in a crutch mode uh, to help support us. Um, DFAX actually uh, ran also with our coal thrusters instead of the coal gas thrusters, and they were able to demonstrate better performance. Um, and then um, we did cathode tests, and we also did um, um, several tests where we uh, improved the thruster control algorithm um, to improve uh, response times um, to actually reduce the, the thruster noise. Uh, and then uh, experiment that was already mentioned was that we, um, the, the primary mission uh, requirements were that we run uh, from 5 to 30 micronewtons, and we were able to demonstrate that we could run up to 60 micronewtons um, uh, with one of the thrusters uh, to demonstrate extended range extended range capability in case that was necessary. So the summary of, um, of what was accomplished um, in, the, uh, in, our, in our mission, um, uh, SD7 was a successful demonstration of a, a drag-free control at a performance level necessary for a ELISA-type gravitational wave observatory. Um, we showed that the space environment, the space disturbance environment is understood at the 0.1 micronewton per root hertz level. The DRS met all the level one position and thrust <coughs> noise requirements. The European LTP inertial sensor uh, functioned in the DRS system as expected. Uh, the 18 degree of freedom drag free control operated uh, reliably in our system. Uh, the self gravity model of DRS is correct at the few picometer uh, per second squared level. Uh, the Coley thrusters and the thrust model were both validated in flight, and that's how simple our thrust model is. But uh, measuring thrust, we were able to uh, determine what the C1 um, coefficient is, um, and, and that basically is a, a uh, depends on mature, uh, the propellant properties and temperatures. Carbon nanotubes also were demonstrated um, in flight, um, and the, the Coley thrusters demonstrate an extend, extended range of uh, 60 micrometers. And so thank you so much for all your support. Um, we, uh, it was an exciting mission for us, and uh, we are so grateful for, um, for being a part of, uh, of your mission. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it's red. Lisa Pathfinder may be gone soon. But we shouldn't really feel sorry. Because now is the time for Lisa to go. And we're ready. I have good news for you. Because on June. 20th, ESA's SPC has selected ESA L3 as the LISA mission. This is very timely. It's only 21 years after the first LISA symposium. And here we see a picture that we've already seen once. You may recognize a few of these faces. Of course, they're much more beautiful now a few years later. <laughs> LISA is really a mature concept by now because it goes back long before the first LISA symposium. It was actually conceived in 1992 in the Chilean Andes, when after the GRG meeting, a bunch of us got stuck there because the baggage handlers were on strike and we couldn't get away. And what do scientists do? They are stuck in the mountains, they invent a new mission. That was the birth of LISA as we knew it. Uh, in those days, it had four spacecraft. Soon after, it became a cornerstone, and then the three spacecraft version of it appeared in 1997. The basic principle of that has been unchanged ever since in the following 20 years. 
It went through a lot of studies, actually through six years of joint mission formulation studies from 2005 to 2011, uh, then with a little dark ages in between, now known as the ELISA or evolving LISA times. Now we're back to where we were and we have three arms again in the mission as is proper for LISA. Let me remind you, there was a March 2011 when Europe decided they had to make do without NASA. Those were not so good days for us because it meant we basically had to redesign the mission for half the money and prove we could do the same science. This little exercise is known as de-scoping, and of course we did that, like all the other big mission proposers in those days. And what do you do? First, the usual things, make the arms shorter, make the telescope smaller, save on mass, use simpler orbits, use a cheaper launcher, which was, uh, which was a Russian steam engine. Uh, but you also have to show pain, so people believe that you can actually save half the money on this. How do you show pain? Well, it's easy. You cut off an arm. <laughs> and that's what we did. Descoping is an art. We really learned it. And that's what came out of this. In bureaucrats' language known as NGO. And as you see, it only has two arms. But if you look closely, you see it has 60 degrees between the arms. And also the three spacecraft look almost identical, except that the two daughter spacecraft there are lacking a telescope. It's kind of obvious what you could do easily. You could insert two telescopes and you're back to the old LISA. And that was the hope all the time, that through international contributions we could get there. But for a while it didn't look good. But then came 2015 and 2016. And two things happened in those years. The first thing was this, the cover of Physical Review Letters, the first discovery of gravitational waves here on the ground. And now the discovery of black holes with gravitational waves is almost commonplace. Almost as many black holes have now been discovered with gravitational waves as with X-rays before, and pretty soon we, will soon we will take over. It's also easy, because if you look at this, then with every discovery with gravitational waves, you get three black holes, and not just one, right? <laughs> the two you start with, and the third one that comes out of it. So now we have 12, and well, uh, watch the press. And the second thing that happened was LISA Pathfinder testing LISA technology, and again we made the cover of physical review letters. And what did we do? We had created, created the stillest place in the universe. And Stefano has already told us, it is more sensitive than the weight of a virus that is sitting down on one of the proof masses with a big chunk. ESA has reacted, and actually the call for mission concepts came out much earlier than was anticipated, three to four years earlier, already in fall of 2016. And the best thing is even NASA is back now. NASA is back in LISA, not the least because of this glowing report here, the midterm assessment of the decadal review, fittingly called New Worlds, New Horizons. Uh, NASA always has these wonderful titles for their reports. I love these. Uh, the call came out, we answered with our proposal on January 13th. If you haven't downloaded it yet, you can download this wonderful booklet. It only has 42 pages, and as you know, 42 is the answer to everything. Uh, it's easy reading, and it's probably the best publication on low-frequency gravitational wave astronomy ever written. So we put a lot of effort into it, so please Read it. And then it happened. On 20th of June, it was selected as L3. What did we go into the selection with? With well thought out requirements. And I will not explain how we arrived at the envelope of all of these requirements. You can read it up in the book where any of these colors has a well defined meaning in there. The good thing is that these requirements set an envelope of the sensitivity curve. Those are the borderline cases that determine our science case. But the good thing is most of the science is in the empty part in the middle. And that means the non-borderline cases, our bread and butter science, is very high precision spectroscopy of mainly supermassive black holes, but also of many, many other objects in the world. 
And this sensitivity curve was just a requirement. And now we've seen that was the requirement and that's where we are. So we have the full sensitivity already demonstrated on LISA Pathfinder. All we got to do for LISA is build it again, but with longer arms this time, quite a bit longer, I admit. Go from 38 centimeters to two and a half million. And then you get all this science out, which I'm not going to talk about. I just wanted to show it to impress you a little bit. I only want to talk about one thing on there, and that is black hole astronomy. This here is the parameter space of black holes, as it will be known by 2030. And plotted there is the distance in terms of redshift. So at the bottom is zero here and now in this lab. In the middle is 10, roughly, reionization. And then above are the dark ages. The farthest known objects ever observed so far at redshifts of uh, 6, 7, 8 in this diagram. On the horizontal axis, you see the mass of the black hole as a logarithm. There's a thousand, a million, and a billion. And now by 2030, we will have marvelous new telescopes, like the LSST, uh, the large telescopes, very large telescopes, extremely large telescopes, and overwhelmingly large telescopes. And even the James Webb Space Telescope will probably have left the ground by then. And these marvelous new telescopes will cover the high end of the mass scale of black holes out to about reionization. At the low end of the mass scale, you see the gravitational wave detectors, which are already in operation. Enhanced uh, advanced LIGO, advanced Virgo, and uh, soon CAGRA. And you see the gravitational wave detectors proper. They cover the low end of the mass range out to redshifts of maybe two. Now, if the third generation gravitational wave detectors like ET or Cosmic Explorer are working, they will go to slightly higher masses and out to about reionization. But you see easily, the whole middle range of the parameter space will still be uncovered by 2030. And now it is your guess. Where in this diagram do you think LISA will be sensitive? Hmm. Yes, right there. Smack in the middle with superb high signal-to-noise ratio, it will observe black holes out to almost arbitrary redshift if they do exist, which, of course, we don't know yet, but it'll fly soon. We've seen this diagram already, and let me point out that this is a weak signal. This is only a 100,000 solar mass black hole binary, and it's as a redshift of five which is almost at the edge of the known universe as we know it right now. It's a weak signal for LISA. And what's plotted here underneath in red is the real experimental noise as we have measured it on Pathfinder. We don't need to extrapolate and guess anymore. We have measured it. And you see what I mean by high signal-to-noise ratio observations. You have a very hard time even seeing the noise on this diagram. So this will be high-precision spectroscopy and even better the black holes that LIGO is seeing. Had LISA been operating 10 years ago, we would have seen them 10 years ago, because now they were entering the LIGO observational sensitivity window at 30 hertz and exiting at 250 hertz. That's because right now they are very close. But 10 years ago, they were far apart and were slowly circling each other with 10 millihertz frequencies. And if you follow the black curve backwards in time, then you see that 10 years ago, these Bligo black holes were smack in the middle of the LISA sensitivity curve. Not only would we have detected them 10 years ago, but we could have predicted the time of merger to a second and the space in the sky where it would happen to a fraction of a square degree. And I can guarantee you that any big piece of glass on this planet would have looked in that direction during that second, trying to find a glimpse of this in electromagnetic radiation. So, we are proceeding. The call for mission concepts is out. LISA is selected. Decision on the L3 adoption will come in the early 20s. L2 and 28, L3 and 34. We, of course, shall be ready for an early launch. And I've taken the liberty of quoting here from the purely technology-driven schedule 
by the Gravitational Observatory Advisory Team to ESA. And if you can't see what it says there where the line for launch date is, then I highlight it for you. It's in 2029 as given only by technological readiness. So all that's required is a billion. Come on. <laughs> and we better hurry up because I will have a long life and I want to hear the Big Bang and I will in gravitational waves, and you also will do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for so many excellent presentations, I have to say. It was really amazing. Um, having said that, of course, there's now the chance for question and answers to the audience. So if there's any questions that you may want to ask to our presenters, it's your opportunity. Questions? No questions. Still digesting. <laughs> OK. You gave all the answers in the presentations that were so... What can you ask? What, 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 what can you ask? <laughs> okay, so I think, uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. Thank you very much to, the, to you for being here with us. And uh, I think uh, in around about two hours we will be exercising the last command from the main control room. So, thanks. <laughs>